But we'll just we'll get going into it. Might as well. Sorry, sorry, I got to wrapped around the axle, but it's kind of it's a beautiful one. The the parabola, the the, the parabola, the the logos to tell us today, the sermon. I love that. You know, that's that's one of the best ever. I, is that John? I don't know if we get it. It's in Luke. Darn. It's John. You know, but we're gonna hit the John parables anyway. There's a few. Okay, so we are talking about uh, John again. And this is some really interesting stuff. So this is, John was not cast into prison yet. I'll say about prisons and guarding places. You know, it's, like I said, it's very interesting that prisons were not used for criminals. They were used for uh, political prisoners. Usually the criminals, you know, and it's the, the whole study of jurisprudence is very interesting. I have a German book about it uh, from Germany that talks about German laws and German stuff, and it's very interesting. I'll give you an interest, a really funny example. Um, touching in Western civilization was considered a illicit thing. So, for example, if you just touch a woman, just touch a woman, that can be considered assault. And you could be prosecuted for sexual malfeasance under most Western cultural laws for that. But, you know, today, you know what? you, you got to physically accost somebody where, and by the way, if you look, some of the early laws, like, for example, Massachusetts, based in German law, especially the places where they had German, Germanic law, touching is still illegal, but usually not prosecuted. So just grabbing a woman... In most Western cultures, can be considered an, an act, an act of offense that can be prosecuted criminally. And in Germany, you would get some pretty good prosecution for touching. Just saying. So you've come a long way, baby. You know, look, but don't touch, right? So, so be careful who you hug. Or be careful who you hug. That's right. You know. Anyway, yeah, laws. Uh, yeah, we've come a long way, baby, in in our Western culture. An argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. All right, this is uh, not too bad a translation, but what's really interesting is not necessarily the translation, but what it says. Uh, then there arose a question between some of the John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. Ignatio became certainly or accordingly a searching the thesis from out of the Matthew, the learners of John, with a Judean through catharismo, washing off or purging. Uh, catharismo, uh, catharsis. The word <coughs> catharsis is really an interesting Greek word because catharsis means to basically vomit. But catharsis also can be used euphemistically and is used euphemistically by Aristotle and Plato and Socrates to mean a catharsis of ideas. So you, a catharsis, but it's really interesting. Carthaismu means a washing off, but it means a purging. So it means a purging. A purging of what? A purging of literally in a Greek sense, the purging of vomit or Awful from something, off of something. So according there became a searching out from among John's disciples with a Judean about washing off, about purging, purification. But what's interesting became a searching out. Now Greek is not, Greek is concrete, right? But we can see this as a euphemistic, from a euphemistic standpoint, that is searching out, searching out what ideas. But a searching out, uh, in a concrete sense, that could be a searching out like as in a looking for, right? Looking for, looking for an idea, or, or looking, um, going to see, going to see what they're doing, going to see them, going to find them, that kind of thing. But the question I have, and this is what is really interesting, is which Judean? Who? Who is this? It has to be a Pharisee, right? Why? Because Pharisees are all into purification, purging. It can't be a Sadducee. Was this Nicodemus? 
I mean, this is the third chapter, right? What do we just have? This whole thing about Nicodemus, who is a Pharisee of Pharisees, right? He's a rabbi. He's a he's the rabboni. He's not the rabboni of rabboni, but he is the rabbi of Israel. He's the instructor of Israel. And who else would be interested in, in purging? And who else is there, right? It says that Jesus and his disciples went to a place, right? They, they were where John was. And I showed you the picture of the place. I don't know. I can't answer this question. Apparently, who it is isn't as important as the whole idea. But then, look what happens. This is really interesting. It says that they have this fight or this, this searching out with this Judean about purging, about purification. And then it says, they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, look, he is baptizing and everyone is going to him. Is the Judean that, the, the, that John's disciples are having an argument with or are searching out with? Is it Jesus? Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, we we tend to look at these things as verses. That's why I don't like to use the term verses. I always use the term statements because, you know, we try to put the Greek into an English binder with sentences and paragraphs and so-and-so. But it's really a logos to tell us. It's always a logos to tell us. So when they bring up stuff, it's not extraneous, right? Have you ever wondered, who is this Jewish dude? I would guess that the Jewish dude is Jesus. This is what who they're talking about. So they had a searching out among John's disciples with a Judean. What Judean? Jesus. About washing off purging, right? And guess what? They came to John and said, Rabbi, that man, that man, that Judean, right? That man. Let's see what it says in the Greek. That The Greek is what's the determinant, right? Because in English, who cares what it says in English? It really matters what does the Greek say. Because that's what it was written in. And that's what old Jesus was talking. They came to John and said, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond the Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizes, and with all men come to him. And a left on that came and went, pro toward John, and said to him, Rabbi, and, and because Epin, said, that means this is a direct quote, who which what in was meta with of you, paren on the other side of the Jordan, to whom you may marekas, may marekas, have borne witness. You look, he immerses, and pantas, all the whole, are coming or going toward him. All, everyone's coming to him. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, who is with you on the other side of the Jordan, to whom you have borne witness, you look, he immerses, and all are coming to him. The Greek is it an obvious question, although it's an interesting point. Is it a question? Rabbi, who is with you on the other side of the Jordan, to whom you have borne witness? I don't know if it's a question or not. I, should, I probably should pull the thing away. but the uh, question mark off of it, but it is uh, stated in, in the sense of a question. You look, he immerses, and all are coming in. The question is about the purification, the effectivity of immersion. That's what their question is about. Because John's immersion, why is John immersing? Immers immersing. Because the kingdom of heaven is here. Why is Jesus immersing, because the kingdom of heaven is here. Obviously, there is something about the immersion that Jesus and the disciples are doing, the mikvah that they're doing, that has something else in it. What is the effectivity? Yes, sir. It just didn't occur to me before that John would have had students who followed him. This kind of introduces that concept. It's like, Kind of see him as a lone guy out in the wilderness, but he's got his kind of own school of followers. Yeah, his whole group, right? Yeah. And his group that some of the group 
and, and they don't tell us how many, they just tell us a couple of them, right, went over to Jesus. It's interesting in itself. Um, John's response is very interesting, too. But look at John's answer. John's answer is a logos to unstated telos. John replied, the first can receive only what is given them from heaven. Mm. This is, you know, we can already say from what we know about the Greek and the translations, this could get exciting, right? John answered and said, a man can receive nothing except it is given him from heaven. He didn't say, he concluded for himself. In other words, he thought about it. He didn't just spit it out. He thought about it. And he said, then he said, and this is a quote, no, no one, nor not as powerful, able or possible, anthros, a man pays a human to Labanon, to take hold of, not however one in the case that, not or lace, it is the dominon given him from out of among of the arana of the sky. John concluded for himself and said, a human is not powerful enough to take hold of anything unless that one is given to him from out of the sky. God's answer is really, really interesting because he is obviously speaking culturally to the people. What is he saying that the there is something about the baptism that is going on with Jesus that is not like the baptism of John. And what is John's conclusion? He doesn't address necessarily the God. He is saying what? It's coming from, it looks like the power of the gods. It looks like something, remember when, when Jesus was uh, baptized and it says that, that the spirit that looked like, or a bird that, you know, it looked like and it came down and, and sat on him, right? That is pretty miraculous. So obviously something is happening, and they're not telling us what's happening, but something is happening in Jesus' baptisms, in the baptisms that are being done by that Judean, right, that guy. They, they don't even mention his name, you see. They say, that guy that you, you testified about, right, that guy, <laughs> that guy, you know. But it's, it's obvious that John, if John doesn't say a man can receive nothing except he's given from heaven. He says a human is not powerful enough to take hold of anything unless that one is given to him from out of the sky. In other words, that power or that ability. Yes, sir. I'm just thinking, too, at, at Jesus' baptism, you got to figure, from John's perspective, he had kind of a wow moment. He wasn't expecting something like that to happen when he baptized Jesus. And it's like, oh, this is shocking to his view, basically. And now it's changed his attitude about what he's doing as well. Yeah, how, how do we revisit that, right? Because, like, this is this is the thing. We we know about it. We hear it. Every year we hear about the baptism of Jesus, you know, and the coming down. And to us, it's what? It's, it's, it's like watching a Star Wars movie over and over again or, or watching, you know, the War of the Rings over and over again. What's the big deal about a bird landing on someone's shoulder? You know, like, I don't know. To us, that's not. Well, if we were there, we would probably go, huh? And, no, and but, but yeah. So saying, I don't know. It just. I, I'm just saying that you know. That's a, so it's hard for me to hear myself like that. That's amazing. Yeah, we're, we're used to, to us. To us, it's a story, right? You know, it, 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 I don't. I think it's really interesting because we are we're jaundiced in our point of view, and to these people, well, to us, if we saw this, right? If if you saw. When the pastor was baptizing some kid up there, and all of a sudden, you know, a, a bright light or, or a flame of fire or a tongue of fire or a bird or a spirit like a bird 
came down and sat on the kid, right? Well, we're forgetting the boys, too. And the boys. Well, what would you do? Shoot the, shoo the bird away? <laughs> get away, get away. Don't poop on my shoulder, right? Yes, but like, yeah, well, what happens when we normally come across a bird up above us? Yes. You know, ah! just, well, get out of the way. I know. When I see the geese flying over, I'm like, okay. <laughs> you know, like, oh. Yeah, when I, when I was a kid, the worst memory, I still remember, we were getting ready to go someplace in the car, and the door was, the window was open, I stuck my head out, and a bird just, oh, whoa, and you're like, oh, man, oh, and, and you have no time to go clean it up, it's like, oh, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't imagine, anyway, yeah, so, something is going on here, right? Well, I was just going to. The previous verse where they were talking about purification, on a lesser level, could they just be talking about the fact that the mitzvah has to be done routinely over and over again, whereas the baptism of Jesus is a one time your full forgiveness of sin, because he has the power to forgive the sin. Um, all right. You're, you may not like this, you may like this. Is there anything where Jesus ever says, is there anywhere in the New Testament that it says a singular baptism forever and ever for the forgiveness of sin? And if we were Jewish believers, what do you think? If you were a Jewish, if you were part of Teen Hodos, what do you think you'd be doing every month? Or more. Yeah. You'd probably be doing it. So uh, I'm not I'm not saying that what you know one baptism is enough, although they did fight wars and kill people. You know, they killed the Anabaptists over this. They killed people over this issue. Lutherans killed people over this issue. Catholics did too, and so did a whole bunch of other folks. So it's like you know, it it wasn't like huge all out war, but it's not, you know. The mikvah is the mikvah, and did people get baptized multiple times by John and by Jesus and by the disciples? No, no. Final Ephesians four five does say there's one faith. Yeah, but look what it says. Is it one form yeah. or one time? Bingo, exactly. I see what you're saying. Yeah, there's yeah, nowhere right. in the New Testament that says one baptism. That is an interpretation of theology and doctrine that we have imposed upon it. And I don't necessarily disagree with the idea one baptism for remission of sin. In other words, where did they get that idea? If you want to go down that rabbit hole, where did they get that idea? Why do you have that? Why do we have that idea? It goes back, it goes back to the whole point of Christ and God. What did you have to do in the past? I got I actually write stuff on the board. Okay, I have a board, I have space. I don't know if it'll be in the camera view, but anyway, we have we have five sacrifices. Five sacrifices. We have the ascension, ascension sacrifice, we have the sacrifice for guilt. We have sacrifice for sin. I see. My first one. We have the priest sacrifice, and we have the sacrifice of thanksgiving. We have five sacrifices. Okay, the ascension sacrifice is done whether you want to or not. However, if you're going to do the ascension sacrifice, what do you have to do as priest? You have to be purified by the mikvah. You have to wash your hands and feet. You have to go in and do all the ceremonial stuff. So this is a priest is doing this. You're not doing it. Okay, sin and guilt. The sin and guilt sacrifice. You have to do the mikvah, right? Mikvah. You have to be ritually pure. And then you present it, right? And you do it. You do the priestly sacrifice. You have to do, basically, you have to have the mikvah, but it's a present, it's a presentation sacrifice. So you have to be ritually pure to do that. Now, the Thanksgiving sacrifice. 
This is the most important sacrifice. What do you have to do to eat the Thanksgiving sacrifice? You have to be clean, and that means the mikvah. However, because of Christ, because of Christ, you don't need the sinner guilt. It's done, right? The priest sacrifice, we do still do this priest sacrifice. That's the offering, by the way. We still do an ascension prayer. These are all part of our worship, but they're not sacrifices anymore. We still do the Thanksgiving sacrifice. But to do the Thanksgiving sacrifice, you require a mikvah. How many mikvahs do you need to eat the Thanksgiving sacrifice? It's very evident. You need one. Because why? Remember Hebrews? Jesus died once for all. There is no reason, again, for your thing. So the reason we don't do a baptism for you Every time you do the Thanksgiving sacrifice. However, we do something, or we should be doing something. You know what every church in Christendom does that we apparently don't do very often? We don't do. What do they do before communion? What do they do when they enter the sanctuary or the, um, what do they call that? The, uh, they dip their hand in the baptismal font. The Catholic churches, you mean? The Orthodox, the Catholics, the church... Uh, the uh, Anglican. Anglican Lutherans are supposed to. We don't do it. Why don't we do it? Because of our baptismal font. I, mean, I should go up there every Sunday and do it. Do. You should. Because what does that commemorate? The mikvah, the baptism. Yeah, yeah. So by doing so, you are remembering your baptism. Why do you think they did that from the early church? Because it represents the mikvah. It, it, remember, I told you the first one. Right? This was a beautiful question. Somebody had uh, I talked to somebody about this today. When, how, how much water is required? Right? That's the first question they wanted to answer just about in the thing. Does the water have to be, do we have to meet all the requirements of the mikvah? And the church said, No. Is someone really baptized if all their hair doesn't get under? Yes. So the early church answered this question. So whenever you dip your fingers in the water and you do the sign of the cross, you know, a lot of people do the sign of the cross this way. Sometimes you do the sign of the cross this way, the full, right? When you do that, you are commemorating just like the Thanksgiving sacrifice is commemorating the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, even Luther said, so remember your baptism when you're washing your hands. Or even during the invocation, when you make the sign of the cross, the same thing. You're hearkening back to your baptism when you do that. Yes, you are. That's why. that you're baptized. If you look in our prayer book, we have a prayer book. If you look at our prayer book, everywhere it shows you the sign of the cross, is you may, you are allowed to do the sign of the cross. You don't do it other times, but in the past, that was like a requirement. When the, the, They don't put it on the screen, but it's still there. I don't care what they say. And guess what Martin Luther said? Martin Luther said, how many times should you do the sign of the cross a day? At least three times. And I guarantee you that when Martin Luther went into a church, he did not, not, Dip his fingers in the baptismal font and, and do the sign of the cross in the in the holy water. They call it holy water. Okay, I'm not preaching Catholicism here. I'm preaching pure <laughs> Lutheranism and Anglican, you know, uh, Orthodox. Okay, this is Orthodoxy. But if you wonder why, why do we do things the way we do them? Why, why don't we do a mikvah? Guess what? We do. Well, we're supposed to ish. Right, we used to. Yeah, we're supposed to. Ish. I, I wish we had, you know, little baptismal things with the water from the font at the front, at the back, so that people could do that. Every Catholic church, every Orthodox, Catholic, Anglican, and about and a whole host of other um, creedal churches all do that, and almost most Lutheran churches do too. But we do, we do a mikvah. So, uh huh. 
And we, we do a baptism um, every time. So do you think John is beginning to realize that it's more, not so much so physical, but it's more of a spiritual thing that's going on? Um, I'm thinking John the Baptist. You know, I, 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 I hate to say it's spiritual versus physical, but what you, what you express is really a good point. Because the whole section from in the chapter 3 has been about panuma and spirit, right? It's all about spirit. And so what are we led to believe? It's spirit. And now we suddenly go from spirit, and by the way, it's not magic. What did they talk about? What did Jesus tell him? You must be born again. How are you born again? Well, they said water. It's spirit, and we take that to be, well, we have interpreted that to be baptism when really he means physical and spirit, but that's cool. But next we get into what? The baptism. What does baptism represent? What does the mikvah represent? Purification. Why does it represent purification? What is it about the mikvah that represents purification? It's not a cleansing. Remember when we looked at the mikvah from a Jewish standpoint? What about the mikvah represents purification? There's so many requirements about the water and the angel and the stuff. Matter of fact, the church even expresses this. What is the mikvah a picture of? About being born again in the waters in the womb? Being born. Because when a child is born, according to Jewish ideology or theology, is it is the baby pure or are they going to have sin? According to Jewish theology, when a child is born, they are pure. Right? And they're pure up until either they say 12 and 13, or pubic hair. So when pubic hair appears on a child, that child has now reached the age of accountability. And therefore, they now are, according to Jewish thought, responsible for their sin. The mikvah represents returning to the womb and coming out of the womb. Because you are, and guess what we use it to represent? We use it to represent death and resurrection, but it also represents being born again, right? The words that Jesus uses. So, yes, these are euphemistic, coolio stuff, but guess what? The euphemism, God, God, and the Hebrews do, and the Greeks turn euphemism into concrete action. The concrete actions in the mikvah and in baptism are literally dying to sin and coming out a purified and different person. Going back into the womb and coming back out pure and perfect like a child. Going into water, if you like, being cleansed. Eh, the connotation, remember, that the Jewish people would say, does a mikvah do cleansing? No, nope, not at all. And guess what? In a mikvah and an orthodox baptism, you do it <clears throat> naked, completely naked. No jewelry, no hair ties, nothing. All Everything has to be immersed because it represents complete immersion, complete death. <coughs> resurrection. Uh, you know, this stuff is so very deep. So when we start talking about this, you know, in these sense, in this sense, right, we're not talking, you know, every person who heard this in this time who understood about Jewish mikvah and, you know, to a degree about church baptism, right, what are they thinking? What I'm telling you about. What are we thinking? Well, we've got 2,000 years of theology doctrine, and also, you know, we, 
I hate to say this, we, we do try to explain the concepts of baptism, but they are, they are very complex points that a lot of times we want to gloss over, right? Because how many, time, how many times have you heard before this class about the mikvah at all? You know, you may have heard about it a little bit, but generally people don't talk about the mikvah. And you never hear about Jews were doing baptism, the mikvah? You might read about it in the Torah if you have a class in the Old Testament, but you know usually we go, oh, yeah, that's what the Jews did, right? Well, Jews they don't, did funny and they stuff. don't use the word mikvah in the translation, so they'll say like, you know, if this happens to you or you do this, you need to take a bath or wash or whatever. Yeah. So we don't really, you know, the specifications or the details. And, and they'll call this baptism, which in Greek means to immerse. But we don't want to translate it as a verse because uh, we do sprinkling and, and sloshing and pouring, right? And sprinkling and sloshing and pouring ain't exactly a uh, So, you know, there's reasons why people don't want to talk much about the subject, which kind of is funny to me because, well, uh, it's like, let's talk about the subject. Let's talk about where it comes from. Let's talk about the history and antecedents and all this other really cool stuff. Because that's what we understand from the culture, right? And, that, and if we understand that, it's just like this. I mean, John Christophanum, all those guys knew this. Most people don't know that our church service follows exactly this. Every, every church service, even the Baptists, you know, the Church of Christ, everybody follows this model. Really interesting. And that came from John Christophanum. Well, it didn't just come from John Christophanum, it came from the Old Testament. From the temple worship. Anyway, you yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but I'm sent ahead of him. Right? We get a reiteration of this. And so you might ask yourself the question, why is why is he said we'll get into this again, right? When it's repeated, it's got to be important. So we had Nicodemus, we had this whole thing about the spirit, and Jesus proved to Nicodemus about the spirit. And now you have John again, and you have this question about baptism or purification, right? And then you also have this thing about a repeat kind of almost. You yourselves bear me witness. I said I am not Christ, but that I am set before him. Yourselves, you to me, bear witness or testify. Hunting, that will be cause, epon. I said, that will be cause, no or not, any, I, I am, ego any. Right there, except it's a not, not, not ego any, the Christus. All other things contrawise, contrarywise, that are because apostolimos, set apart, emi, there's no ego, it's just emi, enforcing in front of that one thing. So we have a very interesting statement here. John has made two negative emo eggy statements. In other words, he is emphatically saying again, I am not the Christ. You yourselves bear witness to me because I said that I am not the Christ. I am, ego emi, not the Christ. Contrarywise, because I am set apart in front of that one. Um, this is a third usage of ego emi, and again a negative, I am not. The next expression is stated as in English, but it's a typical Greek construction. It has the verb to express an identity without the pronoun. So in this case, he uses ego emi, which is a direct imperative or a statement of a very direct statement. In this case, he uses just the verb, which is very common in Greek. We see this all the time. Um, what do you call it? The um, presumption of the pronoun. In English, we can't do this. Well, we could do this, but we don't in English. We don't just say am, right? But in Greek, you just say am, yeah, because that connotes I. In Spanish, I think they do that, too, because each of the pronouns is a different verb form. So they often leave off. Bingo. Remember, gender is for nouns and verbs, and that's what you see in gender constructions in nouns and verbs. You have, you know, masculine, feminine, and neutrum, and that's what you see is you see that verb constructions in many languages have either masculine, feminine, or neutral. That's the way it is. Neuter. Well, in Spanish, it's not that. It's like um, plural or, you know, anyway, for like we versus 
I or, you know, for the different pronouns they have to come up. Not, right. not based on, not based on gender, but based on like, is it you, we, I, whatever. Well, yeah. yeah. For, for example, a second, for, you know, singular or plural. In German, the, uh, the verbs don't, but the nouns do. They take dirty dos. So they, they take masculine. And in German, every noun has a gender. <laughs> it always makes sense. It does not make sense. It makes learning the language sometimes hard. In English, we, have, uh, we used to have two gendered uh, nouns that came from Anglo Saxon. You know what they are? The two gendered nouns? Chips were always referred to in English with her as she. And hurricanes. I think because they were, you know, what's it, hammocanes now? Yeah. <laughs> well, hurricanes because of their relation to ships. Apparently, the Anglo Saxons called the, you know, the ships were she's because they wanted the strength, calmness, and, you know, on the bosom of the waters. And when the waters really got upset, then the, the upsetness was a uh, she too. Although they're, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. Uh, I, I think it's interesting, you know, it, Anglo-Saxon, I, I wish we taught kids Anglo-Saxon more in our, especially in our school system, but you know, obviously that's a dead language. We would never teach that. Like we never teach Latin, right? Or something like that, or ancient Greek. Anyway. Um, you yourselves bear witness to me because I said that I am not the Christ. Contrarywise, because I am set apart in front of that one. And like I said, this is the third usage, and we're using the identity. And like I said, it's really fun to look at other languages. I love to study other languages because just because, you know, um, if you want to understand a culture, study the language. Because the people think the way they write and they think the way they speak. And so if you wonder why people are thinking differently than you, and they do, every foreign person who speaks another language, especially if it's their primary language, is going to think differently than you about stuff. And um, well, I'll, I'll mention this. I think it's really interesting. Love in other countries and cultures means something entirely different than love does in English. And it may mean something different to a British English person, Scottish or Welsh person, than it does specifically to an, to an American. And it may mean something different in different American varieties. But I'll just say it's about the same. But the idea, for example, love in Japan, suke and daisuke. Suke means I like you. Daisuke means I really like you. They don't really have a word for love. Daisuke is the word for love. So you go your whole life being very liked. There is no word for love in Hebrew. There is no word for love in Hebrew. There are four words we translate love in Hebrew, but they don't have anything to do with love at all. Unless you want some really prayer stuff going on. Because the last two were borrowed words, and they are very negative. One is incestual and the other one is prostitution. Um, so which word do they use for, for the um, love the Lord your God with all your heart? It's the word that she used that means basically bow to or to uh, to submit Reverence yourself or? to. Yes, yeah, I think it's Baruch. Something like that. It's, uh, it means literally to bow down to. And it's used mainly of gods, but it is used, if you remember when we looked at the Torah, it's used of, it's used in the sense of um, God to man and man to God, but it is mostly a, an expression of God. It's like agape. It's the, it's the love of the gods. And it means literally to, pro, to put yourself down on the ground, you know, to them, to bow down to them. The other word, and I can't remember what that word is, but it means, it, it, it doesn't even mean like. It means to basically respect a human person. And it's there, we saw them in the Torah, they're using the Torah, but Hebrew has no concept in its words for love. Couldn't just 
read Song of Solomon, and it talks about love all the time. What they use there all the time. They do not use the two later words, which are borrowed from Aramaic. And actually, one is from Aramaic, and the other one is a, another foreign source. Like I said, one means ancestral love, basically the love for ancestral love. And the other one means love, prostitutional love, basically that you pay for it. And if you think about it, you know, uh, a very strong old world cultures, very strong old world cultures, how did you make arrangements? Remember we talked about marriage, right? And marriages were arranged, or marriages were arranged, or marriages were arranged, or marriages were just Just, you put your girls out in the fields and, you know, you, you know, hey, who wants these, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, that, where's love? You know, there is no concept of, there's a concept of respect, respectability of, you know, people, but it's mostly one of arrangement of, you know, um, making arrangements, uh, trying to, you know, uh, produce the best for both people and then also for the family and you know in Greek look we want to think that the Greek worldview there is no real word in Greek for romantic love like we think of romantic love uh, see the closest probably comes is uh, Eros um, Eros really does mean romantic kind of love uh, in the Greek worldview though you can have Eros for a male or a woman so it's not exactly what we would consider, you know, what, what is our view of love? It comes out of courtly love. You know, the, the Western civilization, medieval idea of courtly love is Christian love. And it can even be um, non-sexual. You know, it's, it's the huge thing about courtly love. What's the big deal about courtly love? One person is willing to do what for the other? To die for them. Yeah. And it comes out of Christ. It comes out of Christianity. Because, you know, even Paul says, you know, one person would barely think about dying for another, but yet Christ died for us when we were yet sinners. And, you know, that's, you know, translation, but it's beautiful and it's true. In courtly love, the whole concept of love between a man and a woman and between a person and his culture and society became the willingness to give your life for your society, your culture, your king, your wife, right? And it was courtly love. And it wasn't just, you know, it started, the real power of it, it wasn't just, you know, yeah, I'm willing to die for my king. It was you're willing to die for the person you love, courtly love. And therefore, that's where we get the word love, right, in English. And that's also why love has become... I can love pizza, I love my pet, I love whatever, because in English it's a euphemistic, very spiritual euphemistic statement, you know? You get on, uh, on the movies, right? They're in love and they're just having sex, and you go, oh, you know, that's not what love is all about in the Western sense. I guess it is now, but, yeah. you know, that's what it's become. But in Greek thought, right, uh, phileo, if you're my shield brother, right, I love you, phileo, if you're my shield brother. You know, I will give my life for you because I'm willing to stand on the right-hand side, right? We're going to get to the phileo. We're going to get to the shield brother. It actually is in here. Um, this is it. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him. And it's full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and now complete. Uh, this is a beautiful, beautiful Greek cultural statement that we really miss. He that hath the bridegroom, bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoice greatly, because the bridegroom's voice is my joy, and therefore fulfilled. Uh, this could be confusing to you. You want to leave it, uh, you want to think of it from a uh, euphemistic standpoint, you may, but it isn't. The Eshon, the holding, the Nymphon, a young married woman, bride, Nymphos, a bridegroom, is, Esther, is, the but philos, the shield warrior, the shield warrior, of the nympha of a bridegroom, the hester standing, Kai, echoing hearing of him, 
Char with cheerfulness. Chara. Chara. Charis. Charera. Char. Char. Ia. Rejoices or is glad. Dia. Through the phonet, through the tone, particular beast or artificial, of the nifa of a bridegroom. He, she, it. Accordingly, the char, the cheerfulness, the of mine, per, pep, lerate, kei, may replete. A bridegroom has the holding of the bride, but the shield warrior of the bridegroom rejoices through the tone of the bridegroom, through the standing with and hearing of his cheerfulness. Accordingly, my cheerfulness is made replete. This is a, this is something we'll never probably let you talk about in the sermon, but it's really important stuff. This refers directly to the marriage ceremony and the position of the shield warrior in Greek, the best man in Hebrew cultures. There's a distinct sexual connotation that we miss in this, usually. Because you remember when we talked about marriage? The bride and the bridegroom would consummate the marriage at the end of the ceremony in a tent uh, provided for that purpose. It's called the yeshid, yesh, yeshud. Even today, the Orthodox Jews may set up a consummation tent. Western civilization also had a bedding ceremony. The couple was brought to the bed, usually were not observed in sexual intimacy. The point of the old world marriage is that marriage is sex and sex is marriage. Therefore, there is no marriage without consummation sexually. Um, the point of the statement is that the shield warrior hears the delight of the bridegroom in the taking of the bride. He's also delighted in the winning of the bride, which represents the stage of life in adult development. The level of responsibility considered very important in human life and conduct. And therefore, I'll go back to it because it is a beautiful statement. The bridegroom has the holding of the bride, literally. It's talking about the consummation of the marriage. But the shield warrior of the bridegroom rejoices through the tone of the bridegroom through the standing with and hearing of his cheerfulness. Accordingly, my cheerfulness is made replete. So this picture is the bride, the shield warrior, is standing outside of the consummation tent and hearing the joy of matrimony of the consummation of marriage. And therefore, what he's saying is his cheerfulness is replete by what? By hearing Jesus and hearing about Jesus bringing people to this baptism. This is a really interesting thing because we saw this before. The equate, equating Christ with the bridegroom, right? We saw this in Matthew, Mark, and Luke before. But the equating of Christ with the bridegroom, and guess who the bride is? Yeah, well, the church, Jewish, the Jewish people, the church, right? The people that Jesus Christ has come for. And so, you know, look. Every person in this culture would get this. Every person in this culture would get this. Every person probably until about the 1500s, maybe the 1600s, would get this. It started going out of custom around that time. Although there are even churches in Italy where they have the consummation area in the churches. So anyway, just... And, and by the way, you know, I know our moors are different, but we live in houses with multiple rooms. You know, think a little house on the prairie and, and what your life would be like, you know, uh, as, as you know, an adult and a child, and what you would probably experience, you know, unintentionally or intentionally. It doesn't matter. You know, life is much different. You know, you probably see a whole host of naked people in most every culture until we had, everybody had clothes in multiple rooms, right? And bathrooms in your house. My goodness gracious, you might be sitting right next to, you know, uh, grandma, whatever, in, in, a, in the outhouse. Who knows, right? It, I've heard stories about that before. <laughs> so anyway, the two, the two holders. And they even had multi-holers, too. So anyway, and the Greeks, <laughs> the Greek and the Romans, if you've ever been to a Greek and Roman thing where they have the, the plumbing, right? You, you know, the rows of rows. Yeah, rows of rows. Back to back. You're sitting, hey, <laughs> right? <laughs> Having a conversation. Our world is really different. Thank goodness in some ways. I, mean, <laughs> I know that a lot of things are worse, but it's kind of like for every, for every progress we have, there's a regress, you know? But 
I am glad of the progress. <laughs> I, I don't disagree. I think it's a wonderful thing, but it's funny because we get used to stuff, right? It's more what we get used to. And, and you know, how many of us can go out in the woods and, and survive in the woods, you know, without stuff, right? Yes, sir. Just off the side, I heard the Navy ships, the restrooms were pretty much that way, too. And there's like one red toilet seat, and that was the guy that had disease, and he only the he only got to use that seat, but everybody else pretty much communal bathroom. Yeah, it's pretty much communal bathroom. Oh, I've been on some ships. I didn't know about the red seat. I didn't know about the, <laughs> the red seat. Oh, oh. It is. this is an apocryphal uh, illusion from Maccabees, First Maccabees, which, by the way, remember First Maccabees is the most uh, historically accurate of the Maccabees of the Maccabees. There's, there's four Maccabees. I'll just start with me for a moment. Demetrius heard that Neocor and his hosts were slain in battle. He said, so and so and so and so in the land of Judea the second time with the chief strength of his host and went to lead to Gal, uh, Gal Gala and he pitched their tents before whatever, whatever goes on. There's so many people, etc., etc. So let's go on down to where the illusion is. We'll get to there. That's just the context, little battle stuff going on. Historical stuff going on. I won't read through this whole thing. Okay. Uh, John had sent his brother John, a captain of the people, to pray his friends, the Nabathites, that they might leave with them in their carriage, which was much. And <coughs> the people of Jambri came out of <coughs> Medaba and took John and all that he had and went their way with it. After this came word to Jonathan and Simon, his brother. These are Maccabees. That the children of Jambri made a great marriage and were bringing the bride from uh, Nabatha, Nabatha with a great train, as being the daughter of one of the great princes of Canaan. Canaan. Therefore they remembered John, their brother, and went up and hid themselves under the covert of the mountain, where they lifted up their eyes and looked. And behold, there was much ado and great carriage, and the bridegroom came forth and his friends and brethren to meet them with drums and instruments of music and many weapons. But Jonathan, and they who were with him, rose up against them from the place where they lay in ambush and made a slaughter of them in such a sort as many fell down dead, and the remnant fled into the mountain and took all their spoils. Thus was the marriage turned into mourning and the noise of their melody into lamentation. So when they had avenged fully the blood of their brother, they turned again to the marsh in Georgia. And that's low. Yeah. But isn't it interesting? This is considered an illusion in the Apocrypha. And these were relatively, uh, what do you call it, uh, recent events, right, in the history of Judah. And what's the point here? The way that it's expressed by John implies what? That the bridegroom Christ, everything's great now, but there's going to be unhappiness, right? The unhappiness. We we know this story. We we know the history. You know, we know what's going to happen. But it's very interesting that in this we get an illusion that is kind of negative. That comes from a very and this what it goes on. He must become greater. I must become less. It's not exactly what it says. <coughs> Let's see. That's just the easy translation. He must increase, I must decrease. The reason that's an easy translation is because that sure sounds like a, a what do you call it, a figure of speech in English? What a great figure of speech. He must increase, I must decrease. Sure. That one thing it is necessary to grow, may, me, but to lessen. That one thing is necessary to grow, but me to less. To grow what to grow? What was the last verse? The joy of the, the bridegroom and the bride. Must grow, right? And I must lessen. This isn't, he must increase. And I must decrease. What must increase? The joy and cheerfulness 
in the bridegroom taking the bride. That's what increases. So this is a horrible translation. Yes, sir. Is he taking the perspective that he is the shield warrior and that after the marriage, he becomes less important than maybe the wife? I don't know. Yes. Beautiful. That, that is exactly what he's saying. That, and, and actually, in, in the Greek worldview, yes, the shield warrior is supposed to take less, you know, Prominence that you know. Look, their societies are not like our societies. What do we think? You know, you take the bride, you ride her off to the sunset, and nobody else is there. No, the shield warrior is gonna be there because he's there for you, right? Because when you go to war, who do you want? I mean, you love your wife, but are you bringing her with you? No. no. Who are you taking with you to war? My shield brooder, right? Interesting how marriages ceremonies still have a vestige of this concept. You have a groomsman yeah. that's he's the shield warrior, he's the second to the groom, basically. And yeah. he's happy for the marriage. And after the marriage takes place, he kind of backs out of the picture. He's the guy you're so. going out to the bars with every Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> you're not doing still, that anymore. Yeah, you can still have a really close friend like that, but the ultimately the bride or the and, and in reality, in, in reality, I don't care what you think about the about the Greek worldview or their you know life interaction, but ultimately, who is the most important? What does the bridegroom do with a Greek bride after the marriage? We're talking middle class and above. He, he protects her. In a gynecium, in a house with servants and slaves and people to look over her and watch over her, and he gives her the he, she has the keys of the house. She is the keeper of the property. She is the person in charge of the stuff, especially if he doesn't have a steward. And if he does have a steward, who's the steward listen to? Remember, we saw that picture. Okay. The, the mother of the bride did not get involved, but who was telling the steward? Mary. Now, why would the steward listen to a woman if a woman was not important in that culture? Because she's special? No, because the steward listened to the wife. She was, you know, she was the one who dictated the meals, the servants, the slaves, Everything that was going on in the household. And she had people that she sent the responsibilities. And what do you think the husband, you think, you know, once you took a bride, what do you think the husband did? You, you think he, he said, well, I'm going to manage all this stuff myself. No way. No way. As a matter of fact, in the New Testament, we even have that, I think, in Thessalonians, Galatians, where Christ tells, you know, he tells Christian men. To give the authority of the household to your wife. We mistranslated that. I can't remember what the translation is. It was really a funny translation. But if you look at the Greek, it's like, give the authority, give you, give the unter hupitasso to your wife. It's like, well, yeah. And, and this was a uh, teen hodos guy probably talking to non-Greek or maybe semi-Greek kind of guys. Because guess what? The Greeks got it figured out. They have a culture that works a certain way. The Hebrews eh, kind of do, right? But those in the middle, especially from other cultures, may not have it figured out. And so he's advising them on how to manage their household affairs. And guess what? You give the authority to your wife. She's the one that's, that's the point. Boy, if I had to work out all the details of my whole son, I'd be drowning. That carries through, too. Like you're saying, a lot of these things carry through in the West really long time it's like you read the novels by Jane Austen or whatever it's the lady of the house who's like you know working with the cook on the menu and the food and she's making the arrangements of who sits by who at the banquet and all that kind of stuff yeah yeah I don't know where we get this idea that you know you put a woman on a pedestal and she doesn't do anything it's like that has never been true in western culture nor in any anything I've ever read 
You know, I've never read a Victorian novel where, where that was true. Matter of fact, in most Victorian novels, what the problem is, you know, a lot of times the guy's marry some uh, woman who basically destroys his, his household. That tends to be a, a Western, a, a Victorian era theme, which, uh, give, give me the good ones, you can manage it, not the dangerous ones, right? Anyway, thank you, Father, for your word. We pray you look after us this week. In your name we pray, amen. There's no class next week. Lionel's gone. Oh, my God. He's doing his 40th anniversary program.